Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the grand finale of the Our Warming Planet webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. Let's give everyone a couple of minutes to join and then we can get started. Thanks for being here today. Thank you everyone for joining. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you for joining. We'll get started in a minute or two. Thank you once again for joining the grand finale of the Our Warming Planet webinar series. This is our 16th bi-weekly webinar, which we started in February. So thank you for sticking around with us since then. It's almost been 10 months, so thank you for that. Today's lecture is the last lecture from the book, Lecture 25, Adaptation to Climate Change by Ian Burton and Thea Dickinson from the University of Toronto. With COP27 just days away, and with the focus on adaptation intensifying, this is really the ideal lecture to wrap up this webinar series. And uh, let's go over the agenda briefly. So we will begin briefly with an introduction, uh, with Cynthia and me um, giving the introduction. David Ryan, who is attended almost all of the webinars. Unfortunately, he has a conflict, but he's gonna try and join us uh, via his iPhone if he can. Then we move on to the final lecture, uh, Adaptation to Climate Change by Ian Burton and Thea Dickinson. Then we have Jen Evans moderating the Q&A session. Then we have a two-part panel discussion. We were initially going to do breakouts, but it's too complicated to do it on the webinar platform. It doesn't allow for breakout groups. Uh, but we have a two-part uh, discussion where we have Joel Smith moderating, and then we have part two, where we will take questions and comments from the audience, and we'll give you more instructions on that uh, when we are about to begin the panel discussion. And then Cynthia and I will wrap up. On to the next slide, please. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Cynthia Rosenzweig, the editor of this book, but also the series editor of the Our Warming Planet book series. Cynthia is a senior research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and the Columbia University Center for Climate Systems Research, where she leads the Climate Impacts Group. She co-founded the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project, AGMIP. She was a coordinating lead author for several IPCC assessments. Cynthia was named one of nature's top 10 people that mattered in 2012, and she's a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship. In May 2012, uh, 2022, so this year, just a few months ago, it was announced that Cynthia was the winner of the World Food Prize, and she was in Iowa just a few weeks ago to receive the World Food Prize. So congratulations, Cynthia, on this wonderful achievement, and over to you. Thank you, Manishka, and welcome to everybody for the grand finale of the Our Warming Planet webinar series. Um, I want to uh, introduce the other editors 
of the volume. First is Martin Parry, um, who is visiting professor at the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London. Most, most, most importantly, he was co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2 uh, on uh, impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. Um, and really through that role and his uh, uh, other activities with the IPCC really was a, was a founder of the field of impacts and adaptation. Um, long ago, he was a professor of geography at the University of Oxford. I think one of the founding um, or founding directors there of uh, the Environmental Change Unit uh, originally in a dairy shed, um, now grown to have an entire building, um, and um, in other universities um, uh, in the UK. Um, the book honors Martin, um, who really as uh, the leader and, and one of the key founders of, of our field. Our third editor, and far more than an editor, um, who, uh, because of her tremendous role in organizing the webinar series is Manishka Demel, who's a senior staff associate at Columbia University's Earth Institute, now the Columbia Climate School. Um, and this is where we're all based at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. So by the way, if anyone is coming to New York City, now that we hope travel is lifted for COVID, please come and visit. She, uh, Manishka leads the portfolio um, in, the, in our research group on conservation and development. She was the lead author on the UN Environment Program's 2020 Adaptation Report, GAP Report, and a recipient of a UNESCO MAB Young Scientist Award, and holds both a master's in climate society from, climate un from Columbia University and an MSc from University of Oxford. So those are the editors that that uh, made really uh, really made the book happen. Um, next, on the next slide, I want to uh, do a big shout out to David Rind, who is the series editors, series editor um, for the Our Warming Planet um, lectures um, in climate change. Um, and uh, also for his tremendous help for this particular volume, but you can see um, the um, uh, first one was on, uh, it was on uh, uh, climate uh, topics and climate dynamics, the climate science. This second one is on, as you know, impacts and adaptation. The third one, which is just forthcoming, just about to be published and maybe already published, is on studies of cloud convection and precipitation processes using satellite observations. So this is a cycling back to working group one uh, in the series. But David Rind is a senior scientist emeritus at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies for more than 30 years. Uh, doing important research on um, uh, climate dynamics and uh, was also a professor at Columbia University and has more than 300 publications. So he is our Ank David in the series and, and in particular this volume is our anchor on the climate change, the climate science of the changing climate um, around us. Um, next slide, please. So, as we said, it's a very special book because not only, so it's not just a regular book with chapters. What this book really has is a short introduction to each one of the 25 topics. And then the authors provided 20 key slides so that anybody can grab the slides and give a lecture themselves. So it's um, really a uh, a new kind of book to expand the uh, up uh, the uptake and the outreach of the book. Um, you can see here, and here is what the contents are. So uh, there are four. Uh, the lectures of the, in the book are divided into four topics. The first is methods and approaches. Um, led by Tim Carter. You're going to be um, hearing from him um, later in the panel, as well as uh, Nigel Arnell, um, uh, really setting the stage for, well, how do we study 
um, impacts and adaptation? How do we assess uh, impacts at various scales? Then always following working group two, um, uh, there's the focus on the sectors. So impacts on sectors next, and here represented by Pam Berry and biodiversity, but you can see, of course, and Joe Alcamo is going to be joining for, uh, on the future of water, um, but it included sea level rise, coastal flooding, food and agriculture, um, and of course, urban areas um, rising very much to the fore with the next IPCC special report. Um, but then also we have to we have to change the crystal to have the facets related to the regions, regions and countries. And here we've had wonderful, wonderful um, uh, lectures on the Pacific Islands by John Hay, Caribbean, Leonard Nurse, Africa, Colleen Vogel, and Gina Zervogel. Wonderful, wonderful talk there. And we just heard from Carlos Nobre. I don't know, in the United States, he's been on our on the news very, very much leading up to COP, bringing the Amazon 2.0 solutions um, that he and the fellow scientists um, and stakeholders in the Amazon to avoid the tipping point there. Um, and uh, then finally coming to uh, the end and, and leading up to our lecture today, policy and practice, right? If you, we don't get the policies and practice, it's like we're not there for the last mile of all this amazing work on, on understanding vulnerability and impacts and the theories of adaptation, et cetera. So here, um, we're so pleased we had Gary Yo, a wonderful talk. Uh, by him and his co-authors, Yin Wang and Martin Capella, just very recently from UNEP, and then our lecture today. Um, so with that, you can see it's a really full course menu um, in the book uh, and hope that you all um, get a chance to uh, have you know, per peruse the book in the actual book form. I'm gonna hold it up in a moment. I just, I was cleaning my study and I just moved it, but I'm going to get it and show it next time I'm on screen. But also, of course, the online lectures um, and sharing, um, sharing it with your classes and colleagues. So with that, um, here we go. Over back to Manishka for getting to know the audience. And I am dying to know the webinar statistics about who and, and who and how many people were on and where were, where were they from. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I'll get to the webinar statistics in, uh, in a couple of minutes. But before that, as uh, we have done in the past, we would love to do a poll to get to know our audience as a group. So let me launch the poll. So the first question, as you can see on the screen, is we would love to know which geographical region you're participating from. We typically have a pretty good representation across uh, regions. Uh, in some regions, of course, especially Oceania, it's, it's very late. Um, we now have more than 75% of the audience that have participated. So I'll give it a few more seconds and I'll share the results. So if you haven't polled yet, please do. Great, fantastic. Let me share my share the results. So this is pretty representative of the webinar series in general. Um, unsurprisingly, we do have a lot of representation from North America, followed by Europe and Asia, and some participation from Latin America and Africa. And we've occasionally had a couple of people joining from Oceania, but it's understandable, it's very late there. Uh, and you'll see in a moment, this is really very representative of what we've uh, seen so far. And then on to the next question. We would like to know which sector you work in. So please participate in the poll. Fantastic. We are once again seeing really very similar results uh, to our previous webinars as well. I'm gonna give people a few more seconds. We've had over 80% of our audience participating. So thank you for that. Great, fantastic. I'm going to share this result. So this has really been fantastic. It, throughout almost every webinar, we've had every sector represented. So this is really, really great to see. And we had 
85% of the audience that participated. Great, and our final question. We want to know your involvement in climate change work. Um, I think this poll, this poll is quite representative of what we've seen so far. And I'll show you the results. I'll just give everyone a few more seconds to respond. So we've got almost 80% that have participated. So I'll just give it a few more seconds and we'll see the results. So as you can see, once again, we just have a range of participants. Uh, you know, some are directly involved in climate change, but there are others who wish to educate people on climate change and related issues, people who want to learn more about climate change. So really great to have such a diverse audience with us today. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. Uh, thank you for participating. We would also like to get to know the audience. Uh, so we just got to know the audience as a group, but we would also like to get to know our audience on a more individual basis. I see that some people have already started using the chat. So as we begin, please, if you wish to, please start introducing yourselves in the chat, share as much information as you like. Feel free to include your name, country, institution, role, email, and how you think this book might help you. And now on to uh, the webinar statistics, Jen. Thank you. So we've had 16 webinars covering 23 lectures. We've had over 1,100 participants, and that's an average of about 70 participants per webinar. We've had over 1,500 views on YouTube. So a bigger proportion have uh, has seen this uh, on YouTube, and we hope that you know over the months and years, because that will be there forever, that those views will increase. And we encourage all of you who have joined us to spread the word, uh, because you know uh, I, we think that this is a very useful resource. We have twenty three of the twenty five lectures of the book covered as the um, that were presented. Uh, we had, and all of these have been recorded and posted. The final lecture will also be recorded and posted within the next week. And then coming on to uh, the participants, it's really very representative of what you just saw. We've had participants mostly from North America, Europe, then some from Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia, and some from Africa and Oceania. Uh, representation from almost all the sectors across each webinar, which has been fantastic. We wished we had more participants from Africa and Oceania. Um, the involvement in climate change work also was really diverse. We had, you know, it ranged, as you saw today, from people directly working in climate change to those wanting to learn more. So those are the statistics and over to Cynthia to introduce our speakers today. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce Kali, our colleagues, uh, Ian Burton and Thea Dickinson uh, for uh, to present the lecture today. Um, uh, Ian Burton is Professor Emeritus at the University of Toronto, where he was Director of the Institute for Environmental Studies. He also ser served as Director of Adaptation to the Climate Change and Environment Canada, and has been a lead author of three IPCC climate change assessments. He has also served on the, as a Canadian delegate and observer at meetings of the Conference of the Parties, uh, to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So Ian is a longtime colleague um, uh, in our field of impacts and adaptation, uh, but it gives me very great a uh, pleasure to introduce Thea Dickinson, a new colleague um, to, in our field. Um, she is a climate, Thea Dickinson is a climate change adaptation specialist. She received her PhD from University of Toronto in 2019 and is a contributing author to three IPCC report chapters. And since 2007, she's been amazingly productive 
and authored or co and co-authored over 25 publications on the human dimensions and social responses to climate change and disasters. So uh, on, um, on, on many important topics. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn over to Thea, who's gonna make the presentation. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And Ian is going to start us off. Greetings and welcome from here and myself uh, to especially uh, the editors and organizers of this uh, tremendous uh, uh, webinar series and also to all the contributors of many, many contributors of the papers and lectures that we've uh, been hearing over the last uh, many months. So next slide, please. First of all, I thought I should just remind us of the definition of adaptation written and presented by the IPCC in 2001, 20 years ago. Adjustment, adjustment in natural and human systems in response to actual or expected climate stimuli or their effects which moderates harm or exploits beneficial opportunities. This definition has been useful in drawing attention to the need for decreasing vulnerability, the avoidance of maladaptation, for taking advantage of opportunities presented by climate change. It is inherently interdisciplinary, it's complementary to mitigation and sustainable development, and it urges action and proactivity. Next slide, please. Next. So the outline of the talk, I'm going to talk first uh, about climate change being more than a pollution problem and a, a, a historical perspective, let's say, of the early history. And th then Thier is going to talk about the development of adaptation and some of the challenges that we now face. And then a brief concluding remark or two from me. Thank you. So a little bit of history. The formation of the IPCC uh, was the, the the formation of the IPCC and the UNFCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the Framework Convention. IPCC in 1998, the Framework Convention first signed in Rio in 1992, and interestingly, the first assessment made by the IPCC was released two years before the convention was agreed. And actually at that time was really making some policy recommendations by saying what the IPCC, what the UNSCC should be look, look like and should be doing. Next, please. Next. So given it's 30 years since the signing of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, what has been happening? Well, Atmospheric CO2 concentrations, for example, have been going up and they continue to go up, including after the Paris Agreement of 2015. Next, please. And that was concentrations turning also to emissions. You see that emissions have continued and are continuing to increase. There was a slight reduction caused by the retrenchment and the the response to the COVID pandemic, but we are now back, and this figure is not quite up to date, but we are now back on the course of, of a continuing expansion increase of emissions. Next, next slide, please. But the source of those emissions has been changing. So if you look at the line labeled USA and Europe, you see that those have tended to stabilize and even decline a little bit. Uh, in recent years, well, increases have gone up, have gone risen substantially from China and to some extent also from India. But nevertheless, in aggregate, the overall emissions have continued and will continue to increase. Thank you. Next. So what happened? Well, let me go to the early history and say that when the climate problem was first beginning to be addressed, it was addressed against the background of acid, the acid rain problem and the ozone hole, uh, the ozone layer depletion, both atmospheric problems. Both 
largely resolved as a result of agreements in Europe and North America on acid rain and universally through the Montreal Protocol in, uh, in, in 1987. Next, please. So th the success of dealing with acid rain and the ozone layer depletion um, uh, created some optimism. And climate change was initially viewed through the same lens. It is more than a pollution problem, but it is more than a pollution problem. The rate of climate change was initially underestimated by the scientists working, for example, through IPCC Working Group 1. Climate change has progressed more rapidly than the first models predicted, and there has been therefore less time to develop and implement the technologies and policies for mitigation, as had it been anticipated would be possible in the light of acid rain and ozone layer depletion. So it came, has come slowly to be recognized that we need, as well as the mitigation of the climate uh, emissions and concentrations, we need to deal with the existing and coming impacts of climate change through what the convention refers to as adaptation. Next problem, please. So adaptation was early viewed as something as a hindrance to mitigation. It was regarded as a distraction. If adaptation was successful, some argued, it would decrease the urgency to mitigate. Difficulty in measuring, the, 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 and, and then there's also the problem of the difficulty in measuring and defining adaptation. You can measure emissions and concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but measuring and defining adaptation is not so easy and has not been satisfactorily dealt with so far in, in, uh, in my view. And I think perhaps we need to go back and look at that definition from the IPCC and ask if it needs updating. So these considerations acted as a deterrent to the promotion of adaptation as a response to climate change. Next, please. So because of the approach adopted and because of the slow response, both in mitigation and adaptation, total damages from climate related events, extreme events in particular, have been rising, as you can see from the top curve in this graph, rising very rapidly. And to point out an important difference, this has been more rapid than some similar extreme events and disasters of a non-atmospheric, non-climate change kind, ge other geophysical and technological events. So, in addition to the ongoing, and I should say, disaster losses of this kind reported from Brussels, from CRED, have been going up regardless, but the ones associated with atmosphere and climate change have been going up much more rapidly. Next, please. So we are committed to climate change. It's with us and it's with us for a while to stay. It's changing. It's changing not only slowly and incrementally, as was originally talked about a great deal, but also in terms of extreme events and variability of climate. And the events are occurring, some of them more frequently, and some of them also at greater magnitude. So the previous graphs highlight the losses and the damage caused by climate-related events. We need to adapt. Adaptation is now being widely recognized as Cynthia will, as a, Thea will, will discuss, uh, as a way of reducing risk. But we are not doing enough. We have a serious adaptation deficit or gap. Next slide. Next. So we have a, an adaptation gap and deficit, but also I should add, we are uh, engaged in, a in other processes of disaster risk creation. Disaster risk creation, extreme event creation, extreme, the, the consequences of extreme events, disaster risk creation, is going, is an ongoing process of society generating risks at a faster rate than disaster risk reduction. Disaster risk creation is the process of increasing the risk of losses and damages to socioeconomic and cultural systems. The increased risk can be created by change to the hazards, such as anthropogenic climate change, 
or by continuing increases, continuing increases in exposure and vulnerability. So disaster risk creation includes choices and decisions made at local, national, and global level. And processes from local land use, planning or its absence, or the involvement of corruption, all the way up to unsustainable development decisions. Yes? Thank you very much for my first contribution to this joint lecture. And now I pass over to Fia for her part. Perfect. Thank you, Ian. And um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Great. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for the excellent introduction. And I'm going to take over and discuss the global rise of climate change adaptation. Um, Originally viewed, as we heard, as an unwanted distraction, we now know that adaptation is a global imperative. Uh, since 1992, it has had a very exciting and productive 30-year history. And this is thanks to um, many multilateral institutions, development agencies, local and community-based practitioners, and many, many scholars, some prominent ones, as we've heard, who are on this call and included in this book, um, which is wonderful and all of whom who have contributed to the rise and uptake of climate change adaptation. So to illustrate this, I'm gonna go through four areas. The first is the international arena. The second is looking at the IPCC reports, then looking at peer reviewed literature on adaptation and then national, regional and municipal plans. So, uh, the first, I made a timeline here. It doesn't show all of the pieces of uh, the adaptation puzzle, but when you look at how adaptation has evolved over the past few decades, it's possible to see some major themes that have emerged. Um, in 1994, when the convention came into effect, the conversation around adaptation was essentially, do we need to adapt? Uh, the answer then and now is yes. Um, through the decade, the acceptance of adaptation continued, and by the 2000s, the conversation started to shift to how do we adapt. Following years started several different initiatives, and including the Adaptation Fund becoming operational in 2009, and by the end of the decade, the global community started asking, are we adapting? 2015 marked a fairly momentous shift with the Paris Agreement. And there was suddenly this realization that climate change was not some distant, far off thing, but actually a real and present challenge to our way of life. And impacts started to occur and climate change could just no longer be ignored. So the community, the global community started asking whether societies were in fact adapting rapidly enough and how effective their adaptation actions were. And to parentheses this, the funding agencies also wanted to know how effective their actions were. So now in the 2020s, especially following the um, 1.5 degrees C report, the narrative started to shift again with a lot of urgency this time and a strong uh, vocal voice from the youth wanting to know how much time do we have left, essentially to mitigate the unavoidable catastrophic impacts. Um, Following the release, following that, we just had the release of the AR6 IPCC report, and the community is now asking, or should be asking, whether the adaptation measures that we've been putting into place and putting into policy are socially just, and whether or not, as Ian was alluding to, they're contributing to maladaptive processes or disaster through disaster risk creation or other means. So a second place to observe the rise in adaptation is within the IPCC reports themselves. Ian provided a bit of a backgrounder uh, on the IPC history. So therefore it's not surprising that when you look at this table I made in 1990, uh, the first assessment report had um, no chapter dedicated to adaptation. What was mildly surprising uh, was a quote that I found from working group two in 1990 that stated, quote, this report does not attempt to anticipate any adaptation, technological innovation, or any other measure to diminish the adverse effects of climate change. It was actually working group three at that time that was working on response strategies. Um, an other interesting quote that I found from a subgroup report in 1990 explained adaptation as, quote, developing emergency and disaster preparedness policies and programs, 
Now this will come up later when I talk about fragmentation. So as the need for adaptation became more apparent, so did its inclusion in the IPC reports. And also following the 2003 European drought in France and especially Paris, uh, the IPCC began reporting an increase in the frequency and magnitude of related uh, climate change related events. And as the events increased, so did adaptations inclusion within the IPCC reports. And if you look at the bottom of the table in 2004, there were two chapters, chapter 17 and 18 dedicated to adaptation. And adaptation was also included in the regional and sector sections of the reports. By 2014, adaptation had claimed five chapters, four dedicated and one with mitigation and sustainable development. And the most recent AR6 report um, working group two, all 18 chapters included adaptation. So one of the most striking ways to view the rise in adaptation over time is to see it visualized through the rise in publications within the peer reviewed literature. Now, this is a graph that I included in the chapter, but I've updated it since and the rise is even more dramatic. I think I only included it up to 2014, but now including it up to 2021, um, the numbers that I tell you are mildly unbelievable. Um, so since the time of the first assessment report in 1990, if you look at the bottom chart, uh, there were six publications when the first assessment report was released. By the second assessment report in 1995, there were 18 publications on climate change adaptation. Um, by the third assessment report in 2001, there were around 82 publications at that time. Now, as a side note, I started working in adaptation about the end of 2006, beginning 2007, and I was pretty much able to read almost every publication on adaptation. If it wasn't the full paper that I was reading, I was at least reading the abstract, but now uh, there's not a chance. So the literature on adaptation between 1987 and 2022 yielded 44,590 publications. But what's really phenomenal um, when you look at the numbers is that within the first 30 years of publications on adaptation, there were around 20,000, just over 20,000 publications within the first 30 years. Within the past five years, that uptick there, there were almost 20, well, there were over 20,000 uh, publications on climate change adaptation in the past five years. So 20,000 in the first 30 years and 20,000 in the past five years. Um, as you can imagine, the literature is very wide ranging. There's policy and decision making, uh, literature on adaptation finance and economics, studies by sector and region, adaptation theory, assessments and methodology, human perception and behavior. This has created a very, very diverse set of literature, literature for us to read. Uh, another place that I'm gonna show and one of the last places I'll discuss is in the development of adaptation plan strategies and guidance documents. Um, a little history, back in 2008, I completed an inventory of national adaptation strategies. At that time, there were around 23 countries with comprehensive national adaptation plans. By 2014, when I started my thesis, almost all parties to the convention had some sort of plan, strategy, or guidance document on adaptation. And I've included a few here that you can see the covers of. So for example, Armenia's National Adaptation Plan from 2021, uh, Kuwait 2019, Cook Islands in 2011, Finland was an early adopter or early adapter. Um, they had a publication there from 2005. One of my favorite covers is the um, Australian one in 2014. It's climate change adaptation for Australian birds. That was typically my favorite cover to see. <laughs> so the birds had their own plan. So um, while we're hearing about all this rapid growth in adaptation, uh, the increase in research funding and action, we've also been able to witness some challenges. I'm gonna outline three challenges today. The first is adaptation being a multi-level mosaic. The second is a fragmentation of the adaptation field. And the third is a potential second round of exclusion of adaptation, which we would really want to prevent. So back in 2011, about uh, 10 plus years ago now, Ian and I wrote um, on how climate change adaptation action in Canada was what we termed a multi-level mosaic. 
we noted, and I'll read the quote on the page there, um, that a lack of sustained federal leadership in Canada had forced, perhaps intentionally, a multitude of provincial, municipal, and non-governmental players to develop their own plans, strategies, and programs. And because of this, adaptation was, and I could say is, lacking clarity and cohesion in Canada. Um, an overarching and top-down approach was or is missing in Canada. Um, Canada-wide initiatives had been supported on a temporary or an interim basis and potentially still are. And these statements that we made historically about Canada still resonate today. Um, they're creating many challenges, including measuring and evaluating and tracking adaptation. Uh, we heard last week or two weeks ago in the last lecture on the global goal on adaptation and global stock take, um, these challenges can create big difficulties for synthesizing information on adaptation in order to help support these objectives and other global objectives. The second challenge uh, that has come about because of this rapid increase in adaptation is increasing fragmentation. So what do we mean by fragmentation? Well, it's the concept that adaptation, that as adaptation has grown and evolved, it has become less comprehensive making it harder to effectively implement, track, and assess. And um, this fragmentation that we refer to is visible in almost any area or aspect of the adaptation domain. And I'm gonna outline a few here. I have six listed. So the first place that I alluded to in the previous slide was within countries. We have what we termed a multi-level mosaic. And this can result in uh, administrative fragmentation where countries, um, wh whether they start arguing who's gonna pay, will it be regional, will it be national, municipal, or are you gonna pass it on to the landowner? The second place we see fragmentation is with, at the institutional level, um, including in academics. Uh, for example, you can have a disciplinary silo. Another place that we have fragmentation is within the United Nations themselves. So not only does the UNFCCC work on the adaptation file, but so does the UNEP, the UNDP, the WHO, the FAO, and essentially all the other acronyms that we can come up with. And this unfortunately can result in a lack of ownership of the adaptation file, a lack of cooperation, um, an expectation that another organization is going to pick up the file. Um, it can also cause duplication of efforts and lead to gaps or inadequate policy development and implementation. Another place where we see this uh, uh, separation or fragmentation is uh, between the UNDR and the UNFCCC. So the separation of disaster and climate. And if we recall back to the quote that I gave from 1990 that explained adaptation as developing emergency and disaster preparedness policies and programs, it sounds like adaptation would be housed under the UNDRR with that definition and not under a different umbrella. Um, when you think about different impacts, for example, flooding, you can question, is that a disaster impact? Is that a climate change impact? And how do you even separate the two? There was an attempt um, in 2012, uh, the SREX report, the special report on extremes, where the two communities came together and wrote collectively. And my hope would be that that would uh, continue. Another area, as we can imagine, um, it, to see this fragmentation is within the literature themselves. Uh, there was abundance of information I showed on the previous slide. Um, tons of knowledge, tons of research, which is wonderful, has been developed over the past 30 years, but it's made it hard to synthesize and make something like meta-analysis very difficult because there's no cohesive vision um, for the research as a whole. And lastly, I'm gonna discuss the use of language. And that takes me to challenge three. So the third challenge and the last challenge I'll discuss today um, is a newer one. And like we witnessed back in the early 90s and the early 2000s, as Ian alluded to, there is an attempt to exclude adaptation from the climate policy arena. And from my viewpoint, there's a second attempt currently occurring. And this attempt is through the use of language replacement there's a tendency to replace the term adaptation, which is directly tied to funding needs with the term resilience, which is not tied to funding. Um, without getting into too much discussion of adaptation versus resilience, they are not interchangeable terms and they're not interchangeable definitions. 
a big part of our chapter um, that's in the book discussed the Green New Deal. At that time, um, the Green New Deal did not use the term adapt or adaptation, and instead it discussed resiliency. So it would say, for example, building resiliency against climate change related disasters such as extreme weather, which brings me to the very new Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which does include the term adaptation. And in fact, there are four sections in the new IRA that explicitly include adaptation alongside some nice funding values. So in order to keep adaptation prominent and continue its rise in success, I believe that it's very important that we keep using the word adaptation alongside resilience if need be, but ensure that the term adapt or adaptation is explicitly included in policy and not overlooked like it almost was in 1992. And with that, I will now turn back over to Ian, who will close us out with some concluding remarks and ongoing challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Thea, for that uh, wonderful and remarkable account of the whole story of, of adaptation, where we have been, where we're at, and where we are going. Just one or two concluding remarks from me next. Um, Clearly, climate change, loss and damage is almost certain to continue to increase well into the future. This results not only from continuing and growing greenhouse gas emissions and concentrations, but also from insufficient adaptation, especially anticipatory adaptation and unrecognized maladaptation, attempts at adaptation which in the medium to long term can make things worse and the process of growing vulnerability and exposure. So the climate crisis gets increasingly more acute and is an ex existential threat to the planetary environment, human economy and society. So can local and nat national adaptation of which we have seen a, a great explosion of discussion and documents and some action be integrated into a more sense of a global strategy in which we are ha and have been trying to develop with mitigation. So adaptation is no longer to be uh, is no longer to be understood as simply a response to external threats, but to their human creation. Yes. So can adaptation now be a key element in the development and application of response to the broader international crisis, multi crisis? which we are facing, including forced human migration, pandemics, malnutrition and famine, wars and violent struggles, Ukraine at the moment, and the ongoing social and economic inequity and justice, not only within countries, but more and especially among countries. Uh, is there opportunity? Is there hope? Yes, of course. Can adaptation play a role in the resolution of these problems and threats and help to recon reconcile the fractured and opposing interests? So adaptation is moving beyond an unwanted distraction to the mitigation of climate change towards a role in global transformation. Next, please. So humanity is now faced with adaptation to an external world, but which is, I could say, almost entirely or largely of our own creation. We live in what people have chosen to be calling the, the new geological era of the Anthropocene. Can we adapt, therefore, not to all these external things, but to ourselves and the world that we have created? As the stripped cartoon Pogo said, in April 1970, to celebrate first Earth Day, we have met the enemy and he is us. That was 50 years ago. A lot has happened in 50 years. A lot has happened in the last 30 years since the United Nations Framework Convention. But clearly this talk and many of the talks that have gone before have showed that there is still a lot to do and far to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm the designated clapper. Thank you so much, Ian and Thea, um, uh, for this wonderful 
uh, very cogent and very important overview as our final lecture of where we are in adaptation. As Ian just said, a lot of progress, but as, as the data that they have showed, uh, still um, so much uh, more to, to really so much more to do. Uh, with that, I turn over to Jen Evans to lead the questions for um, uh, Ian and Thea. Okay, great. There is a lot of conversation going on in the chat. Um, so that's wonderful. We love to see that. Um, I do have a bunch of questions. I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them, but maybe if we don't, they'll come up um, in the next panel. Uh, but I'll start with the first one, which actually also came up in, in concluding remarks um, from Hassan Awada, who asks, um, I would like to ask, what do you think about the current and future situation regarding the use of fossil fuel and will the Ukraine war speed the shift to green energy? That's a, a big question. <laughs> it was it was asked to Professor Ian, but <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. um, um, I think there's a there's a short term and a long term uh, response to this, as I understand it. In that, um, uh, of course. Um, the, the the Ukraine situation and Russia's actions has um, exacerbated the situation with respect to energy supply and has led to, um, in the case of Germany, for example, going back to reopening and op keeping open coal-fired uh, power plants uh, in order to have some hope of meeting its its own uh, needs for, for energy over the coming winter months when supplies from from Russia are uh, limited or not available, uh, and this is this has its ramifications more, more broadly and 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 in, internationally, uh, pushing towards an increase of fossil fuel production in the in the Western world, particularly to meet the needs in the short term. But of course, I think in the long term, uh, it 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 does clearly have effects on encouraging countries to move forward to being uh, uh, energy uh, independent as much as possible. That is to say, not relying on supply of oil uh, and natural gas uh, from other countries because of the, of the danger that, 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 that puts them in. So I think in the, long, in the short term, it's bad news. In the long term, medium to long term, I think it, it is going to help um, move forward the transition from away from fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, so there's a couple questions on loss and damages. Uh, so Thomas Brewer asks, Denmark was recently the first national government to announce its support for loss and damage contributions and committed about 13 million equivalent contribution. Do you think other countries will announce loss and damage commitments at COP coming up? Thea, do you want to choose it? I, if if they're pressured to do so, um, what was it? Fossil of the day that they used to, you know, hang them out and you know put a country, you know, Canada on a on a podium and say that you need to do more. Um, I think it's going to take peer pressure, um, develop country pressure, and if you already have Denmark stepping up, then it's going to have other countries look to say, hey, we need to make a contribution here. Um, I don't know how many years ago I was fairly naive and believed that you know adaptation could solve all. And I think Hurricane Maria set me straight on that and made me realize the need for um, you know what essentially a lot of people term just like a cash grab, like they're just you need money. Um, but but in in reality, we can't adapt to everything, mostly because we lost so much time not doing anything. Um, that that the need for loss and damage is great. And hopefully next week we do see a shift um, towards more support for it. Thank you. And then this question actually kind of follows up um, on that answer. So Roe V asks, have you or other researchers compared the financial cost of adaptation, including abandonment with the cost of mitigation? I guess you could also say with the cost of loss and damages as well. 
I hope there's somebody else in this meeting that could give a more authoritative answer to that question than I can. I don't know what Thea has to say. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to. If it could be worded a second way, then I might. Um, the cost of adaptation versus the cost of mitigation. I think there's a great difficulty in measuring the cost of adaptation, and one one of the things that has come up in the uh, in the negotiations is if countries commit money to a fund for meeting costs of adaptation in the global south, uh, for example, um, the accusation is sometimes made that donor countries are taking money out of their development assistance budget and just switching it over and and calling it contribution to adaptation. So maybe the, the development assistance budget goes down and the adaptation budget goes up. And, and what's the difference between the two? And that brings me back to the whole problem of the definition of, of what is adaptation and what is how does that differ from other development activities and how do those development activities themselves sometimes increase the vulnerability and, and exposure? Complicated question. No clear answer. Okay, we. I think we might have time for one or two more. Um, and let's see, you're asked Ian or Thea the, uh, um, to comment on the role of transformation and adaptation. Will all adaptation need to be transformative? No. <laughs> like <laughs> the definition of transformation is, that's been a, um, you know, you asked, four different adaptation experts what trans, the definition of transfer, transformation is and you get a dozen different answers. Um, so I think that's a, that's a tricky one. It depends on how you define it. And it depends on, we're definitely gonna need more transformative action now because of the delay. So um, and depending, again, depending on what you call, call transformational adaptation. Yes, I would, I would add, I, I, I agree, agree with, with fear that, that, that one does need both. One needs a lot more applied adaptation in the traditional sense in which we've been using it. But I think you can also see those kinds of actions coming together uh, in a more strategic way to address some sort of recreation of the global order. Let's face it, what we've lost in the last few years, decades or so, it is, uh, and, and maybe going back to the collapse of the old Soviet Union and so on, is, um, is, is a sense of what, what is the global order. And we, we had a global order, it, it was far from satisfactory, but it, it, it kept things within, within a reasonable range of balance. And now we're going away from that. We're going to a, 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 a view in which there's very much national self-interest being put first, and a diminution of serious commitment to the global, the global issues that we face. So I'm wondering if looking forward to a transformation or the recreation, creation of a new global order, whatever that might be, is there a role and what is the role for adaptation in that? Okay, thank you. And I'll just finish off uh, with asking if, if you could comment on the concept of maladaptation, how it seems almost easy for adaptation be, to become maladaptive, and what are like the most crucial factors that need to go into adaptation to prevent this? Yeah. So I have a, a lot of, a, a whole webinar that I could talk about maladaptation. Um, essentially, we need to remember that adaptation isn't neutral. So at any point that we're entering or re-entering places and spaces in society, we're creating change. And, and this change may be beneficial or it may be harmful. Essentially, there's a perspective that because it's adaptation, it's great. <laughs> and we might not think about a lot of these things. Um, a lot of times there's a thought that um, maladaptation is an unintended consequence, but um, I, I don't truly believe it. I think a lot of times it's predictable and it's preventable. So that's my short answer. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll quickly add, and, and this is going to be controversial, I'm sure, 
mention two brief examples, one from Bangladesh and one from Pakistan. In Bangladesh, there's a big project in the uh, coastal um, Sundamans uh, region on the very south coast of uh, the Bay of Bengal, financed largely by the Asian Development Bank, which is increasing, improving infrastructure standards and other things in, the, in areas, showing great excess of benefits over costs in 50 years, and then the line is drawn at 50 years. But if you look towards the end of that 50 years, the place where investment is now going on, called adaptation, increasing the economy, attracting more people to the region, uh, will in fact, according to the same document, be well below sea level. So what is good adaptation in the short run may make things worse in the long run. And there is current controversy about the ongoing Pakistan situation because there's a lot of talk about how climate change has made that situation of the seasonal monsoon and associated flooding much, much worse. And, and the catastrophe that you see going on in, in Pakistan at the moment is due to climate change. Whereas there is another voice that is saying it is not only due to climate change. Yes, climate change is the big factor. But also, if you look at the development choices and processes made in Pakistan by Pakistan and by foreign contributors to the economy in various ways, that has created more exposure and more vulnerability to their flood to those floods than they used to be. So it's a mixed situation. Thank you. Thank you, Thea and Ian, and thank you everyone for putting in your questions and comments into the chat. Um, it was such an informative lecture and a great discussion afterwards. Um, but we are moving on to the panel now. So I'll pass it over to Nishka and Joel. Thanks so much. That was a really wonderful uh, Q&A session. Uh, great uh, to see so much engagement from the audience. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Thea, Jen, and the audience. Uh, and there will be opportunities to continue some of these discussions uh, shortly. And next, we have our two part panel discussion moderated by Joe Smith. Uh, our panelists today are book authors and speakers from the series. And I'll just take a minute to explain how we are going to proceed with the two part discussion. So, for the first 20 to 25 minutes, we have part one where Joel will moderate and pose questions to the panelists. Then for the next part, which is also about 20 to 25 minutes, we will have questions and comments from the audience. As I mentioned at the start, we initially intended to have breakout groups, which this webinar platform does not mm -hmm. allow. So therefore, uh, we want to still include some direct interactions between the audience and the authors. There, so, therefore, we have two options. You can either send us your questions to the Q&A function, or you can raise your hand and then we will allow you to speak and you know you can ask a question, you can comment. And when you do raise your hand, please mention that you've done so in the chat so we can do it in the right order. And we will place some instructions in the chat too. And I think let's just jump right to it. So I would like to uh, invite Cynthia to introduce our moderator, Joel Smith. Over Thank to you, you Cynthia. Manish. Thank you, Manishka, and uh, it's, uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to next in, uh, introduce um, uh, my very long, uh, longtime colleague, Joel Smith. Joel has over 30 years of experience in researching and advising policymakers. Joel has played a very key role in the linkage to policymakers, I believe, from our, uh, in our community on, on vulnerability and adaptation to climate change. Uh, he was a principal after he, he left uh, EPA, when, when I, US EPA, where I first knew him. He became a principal with APT Associates in Boulder, Colorado, and he also has been uh, very active in the IPCC reports, including um, I, Chapter 19 in AR4, which I believe is the first time that 
that burning embers um, was uh, brought forward by our community. And, and Joel was one of the CLAs um, uh, for that very important chapter. Um, he's also been deeply involved in the national climate assessments in the United States um, and, um, and is now just about to take up a new role in which he is going to be leading the National Academy of Sciences review of the most recent uh, national climate assessment. So I think, Joel, they, uh, the, uh, the academies could not have found a better person than you to conduct that review. So over to you. Joel's going to introduce all the panel members and moderate. Thanks so much, Joel. So thanks, Cynthia. So let me just for the record state, actually, we did Burning Embers in AR3. And one of the chapter authors was somebody named Cynthia Rosenzweig. Oh, she not only worked great. on developing burning embers, but also worked on attribution of That's climate right. impacts. Remember, there is another field that started, and you started that I, in that yeah, chapter. I got, I got my <laughs> it's been so long wrong. we're forgetting. <laughs> I know it exactly. I got my AR number wrong. It's AR3 yeah, that three we worked on that together. In 2001, right, 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 right. right. I saw Gary shaking his head, and so he's going to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary was an author, too, so we had you know, a bunch of us. And, That's uh, right. And I should say, Ian was on the adaptation chapter there. So... Um, let me just say before we jump in. Oh, and Manishka, how much time do we have on the panel before we go to the? We're going to go to the audience questions. About twenty minutes. Okay, so let me Great, speak uh, quickly. But I, first, let me just thank Cynthia, you know, uh, Manishka, David, and and Martin for pulling this all together. I mean, this is, you know, not only have you assembled a very impressive publication, but I I found these. Um, you know, bi-weekly lectures just to be very well done, to be fascinating. It's kind of, we've created a little community here. And I have to admit, I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do two weeks from this Wednesday. I guess <laughs> I'll work on the review of the NCA5. But, um, you know, it's so, uh, you know, but this, this has been great. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Ian and Thea, I thought, for a brilliant lecture that really um, captured, you know, really it was a nice way to look at adaptation and, and, and to take the, the long view and to see where, where we've come and maybe where we haven't come. So with that, I want to introduce the five panelists. And I just want to, and as I'm introducing, I'm going to suggest that those in the audience, you might think about the combined, we're all, these, these are all people, colleagues and friends, and all have a lot of experience in this field. And we're going to draw on that in the questions. And I invite everybody to think about the combined age of the panelists and the moderator. And whether that number is higher or lower than the current level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe close, the answer. Um, but I'm also, and I see Ian la laughing, I'm also going to um, ask Ian and Thea to sort of serve as ex officio members of the panel and maybe give you a chance, give you guys a chance to catch your breath, but maybe after the panelists opine on things, you can weigh in too. So without ado, uh, we have uh, Dr. Joel Camo, who's a professor of Environmental System Science and Director of the Sussex Sustainability Research Program at the University of Sussex, and gave a lecture on climate change and the future of water. Uh, Nigel Arnell is a Professor of Climate System Science at the University of Reading in the UK, and spoke about global scale impacts of climate change. Uh, Dr. Pam Berry is a Senior Research Fellow, Environmental Change Institute, University of Oxford, and spoke about climate change and biodiversity with a focus on nature-based solutions. Dr. Tim Carter is a research professor at the Finnish Environment Institute, and that may be why Finland uh, did its adaptation plan so much ahead of everybody else, um, and spoke about methods for impacts and adaptation assessment. Dr. Gary Yeo is the Huffington Foundation Professor of Economics and Environmental Studies, Professor Emeritus at Wesleyan University, and gave a lecture on risk management and climate change. Um, so with that, I want to turn to the questions we have. And I just want to maybe just briefly start. We, you know, many of us doing research for many decades and think back about how has the um, the research evolved over the decades? What kind of questions we're looking at way back when? What are we doing now? Maybe a little bit on what we've learned, but try to, try to keep your answers short. Um, I'm just going to go around first with the order which I introduced you. So I'll call on Joel Camo first to view, give your views on this, how, how the research has changed over the decades. Yeah, great. Hello, Joel. Hello, old colleagues. Yeah. You need old colleagues, huh? But anyway, hopefully there's a lot of uh, young folks out there that are going to finally save the world. 
don't know about us anymore, but how has uh, research evolved? Well, when you start research with only having a thermometer to measure the air temperature and a bucket to measure the precipitation, then I guess you can say that it's evolved, it's got to have evolved somehow. Although I started particularly in um, integrated climate change modeling in the 90s. So I also already started with a very integrated approach and then eventually ended up uh, being less satisfied with just looking at climate. And now I would say my research and the research of my colleagues focuses a lot on the linkages between climate processes and the sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. which I think is, uh, if anybody was to ask me, what's the hope of the world? It's finally when we're gonna be able to align our uh, goals for development with our goals for climate protection. Right now, I still think they're going in parallel paths, which is making everything seem very expensive and daunting. But if we realize that in order to deal with the climate crisis, we'll also be addressing the basic issues of increasing our well-being, then for me at least, it all becomes a lot less daunting. So excuse me for that long answer to <laughs> no, your that's, question. But that's that's my take on it right now. Thanks, Joe. That's insightful. Okay, Nigel. Hi. Right. Well, when I started work on climate change impacts and consequences, the perspective I took was very much, this is back in the early 1990s, if not before, it was very much top down. Um, we had climate scenarios created in some arbitrary ways in many senses in the early days, and we ran them through our models and we looked at the impacts and we thought, right, well, that's, that's it. Those are the consequences that you need to plan for. Um, and I think one of the big changes that we've seen over the last 30 or so years, parallels in this in many senses, the changes that happened in research into environmental hazards generally, although they're not together yet. Um, and that's an increase in interest in what it is that makes exposure and vulnerability. Um, and it's not just the climate, as Joe just said, that's causing the problem. It's the things that influence our exposure and our vulnerability. And I think we're still in the in the community of people who are looking at research into impacts and consequences. I think we, we are still a bit railroaded we there's a, a, a part of the community that is very top down and then there's a part that is very much looking at exposure and vulnerability and i think we're not really as linked together uh, as as we could be we might want to develop that a bit further later and i think that has implications for how we assess risks and how we interpret what we need to do in order to adapt um because adaptation isn't just a question of you know here, here's a projection of what could happen just plan for it is way more sophisticated than that. And the way we go about estimating what impacts and risks are influences very much how we think we could adapt and what information we think we need in order to adapt, um, which is something, again, we might want to pursue in discussion later on. So that's how I think things have shifted a, a bit, but they're still, on, in a sense, on parallel tracks. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't really... You know, got a single coherent way of looking at the problem and that is primarily i think because there isn't a single coherent way of looking at the problem these different perspectives are all really important um but we often think that our perspective is the right one um but it's not <laughs> all right thank you nigel that's good uh pam right well nigel said some of the things that i was um going to say i very much agree that we've moved from impacts um, and thinking, well, we know how we need to respond to seeing actually we need to widen out how we view our responses um, to what we know about impacts. And I think, um, you know, Ian and Thea were talking about the need for sort of integration. Um, and so I think integrating adaptation with responses, um, particularly to other environmental problems, um, is extremely important certainly for me from the sort of biodiversity perspective and that's one of the reasons why I was keen to talk about nature-based solutions where you're looking at how you can possibly um, address sort of biodiversity loss the need for climate adaptation but also the need to address other societal um, mm -hmm. problems so I think you know that's where we perhaps just got to, but we need to really develop that research agenda much more, I think, to have this integrated approach. All right, thank you. And Tim? Right, um, 
I actually started uh, working on climate change in 1980. And um, just uh, following up on what Thea said earlier, um, I actually read all publications on impacts and adaptation and climate change science in the library. I, I went from journal to journal. Any journal that had climate change information, I, I looked for. And um, I managed to sort of find, find it somewhere. And um, so I had a card index system. Of course, we didn't have computers then, not, not really usable computers. And uh, so, so in a sense, my sort of early research was using a calculator, that, not, not, not a computer, in 1980. Martin asked me, to, Martin Parry was my supervisor, and um, he asked me to do some uh, historical analysis of uh, Edinburgh statistics of climate, to convert, convert them into growing degree days, and I used a calculator to do that on paper. And uh, only later was I uh, introduced to the computer and some Fortran programming, and uh, uh, so, 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 so these things have moved on a bit since then. <laughs> and... Um, so my PhD work was on was on crop modelling, um, mod, and, and actually there was only one crop model I could use in the United, United Kingdom at the time. So and I think the Netherlands had one. That was about it. So uh, Cynthia will know very well now that uh, there are probably hundreds of them being intercompared to come up with some estimates of uncertainty. So uh, so yeah, uh, things have changed a lot, and uh, I, I certainly sympathise with many of the views here about to how 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 things have moved on. And another thing from the early days was uh, we actually started to use um, the very earliest uh, general circulation model, global climate model projections of the future. Um, and in those days, uh, in the 80s, uh, all you had was either a doubling or often it was a quadrupling of carbon dioxide and uh, the response of the climate to that. There was no indication of when that would happen um in the future sometime in the future and uh so we, we were sort of working with that information and try, trying to make sense of it in in, in, in trying to project where what, what does that actually mean for for for, for 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 um agriculture or for forestry or for, for other sort of natural uh, hydrology and, and and other systems so so again things have moved on a lot um since then but uh yeah surely the 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 the, the, the focus though on not only the climate hazard, but also the uh, so the, the exposure and vulnerability, or the exposure and susceptibility um, to, uh, to to those hazards. Uh, certainly, that that I think has been a shift, and um, I, I'm quite involved now in in developing socio-economic scenarios at regional level, which take into account or try to take into account possible futures, future developments in uh, exposure and vulnerability, because they're they're critical for understanding. What sort of it, what sort of impacts might occur, and how the climate will interact with with, with those? Yeah, hey, Tim, you don't look right. so old. You must have been ten years old when you started, huh? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I think it was in the womb. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Tim, and then Gary. Oops, your mic, Gary. Oops, it's still you're still muted. Gary, you're still muted. Hmm. Anybody read lips? We can translate. Yeah, we can. OK, there we go. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've been doing this since 1982. It is wonderful to see all my old friends on my <laughs> TV screen. Um, what, what do I think? What I think is there are no solutions. Um, that we can adapt, we can mitigate, and there's a residual that we will never overcome. And so we have to worry about that. Um, mm. So I guess, I guess Joel, that's, that's my fundamental, that's sort of fundamental okay. conclusion. Um, we have to not talk about solutions. We have to talk about making things better. And two degrees is better than three degrees. One and a half yeah. degrees is better than four degrees. Um, and and uh, we go from there. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Actually, I'll make a couple of comments. I, I like to say when I was young, I thought I could make the world perfect. Now I'm older and wizened, and I just want to make the world better. Um, yeah, exactly. And I'll also point out one thing that I, I thought these are very thoughtful answers, but none of you mentioned is we're seeing impacts now. Remember, it was all in the past. It was all looking forward. 
And we were sort of trying to look, well, what might happen? And I think one, and some things have happened as we thought many other, I think one thing many of us said to cover our rears was, oh, there'll be surprises. That prediction came true, right? <laughs> there've been a lot of surprises. Um, and it's uh, things, some things are, I would say are quite different than we had we thought uh, some things uh, as as we, ex maybe as we expected, nonetheless. So let me ask, I wanna check in with the, uh, with Manishka and Jennifer on time because it's 20 after the hour. Should I do another question? There, we have some good questions and continue with the panel, yes, maybe please. one more. And then I'll yes. invite e also invite Ian and, and Taya to write. So this is following up on this. And it really is sort of, we were talking about where we've been, where we are now. Now let's turn to where where is where should research be going in the future? And really, um, you know, what are the emerging topics? What needs to be addressed? What might you like to see as next step? And I thought one way maybe to crystallize it is if you're advising, um, you know, a PhD student or a postdoc, and they're asked, gee, where, you know, where I, I'm interested in this vulnerability annotation stuff. Where, where should I take my research career? What, what might you advise that? So I'm going to reverse order. And Gary, not giving you a chance to uh, recover, but I'm going to go back. But start with you, Gary, and see what would you uh, advise uh, uh, new side, uh, new science, new scientists coming on board this field. I I I think that um, we have agreed that it, this is a risk management problem, and we need to worry about high risk. And so I would lead. Uh, graduate students, researchers, me, uh, to think about high risk possibilities, which does not mean high likelihood possibilities. It, may, mm. it could be low possibility, but very, very high consequence, like uh, the collapse of the Thuades ice sheet mm. in Antarctica. And, and and go beyond, oh, more sea level rise and stuff like that. But but go to the to the um, communities that will be affected by a four to sea level rise in a in a decade and a half. Okay, thanks, Gary. Tim, what would you advise? Uh... Students okay, maybe they yeah, already have um, now. But... <laughs> I, I wondered about this, and, and actually, quite recently, um, I sort of came across uh, some 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 discussion. Of course, we've known about this for quite a long time, and and actually, it's an area I think of very very great ignorance um, worldwide, and particularly in the sort of high latitudes, high altitudes regions. And it's to do with uh, permafrost thaw, and uh, the implications. Now we, now we all know that permafrost thawing um, due to warming is uh, is a problem for infrastructure, of course, um, and uh, release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, so feeding back into the climate. But one other thing that I think has been very under-researched, and I think that was confirmed by um, a, a talk I saw for, by, by a professor of uh, epidemiology from, uh, from um, Sweden, um, is the health in, potential health impacts. Um, of release of um, viruses or other um, sort of uh, bacteria um, out of the permafrost, some of which um, could easily be uh, diseases that, that we've had in the past but uh, ha ha have now been eradicated, but could be reignited, if you like, by, by that, but also many others that we maybe don't know about. And for the local populations, uh, may, may ha have absolutely zero or very little um, resistance to. And uh, this was being flagged as something that has been terribly under-researched and would be a very, very high priority perhaps for um, some sort of um, setting up of a monitoring capability, global monitoring capability to, uh, to actually just, just actually monitor public health implications of this and, and, and look into this is issue. So that's that's something, uh, a sort of open area. I, I, it's not my expertise really at all, but um, I'm, I'm involved in the climate and health uh, program in Finland, but uh, but th this certainly is something that uh, I, I wasn't so aware of. That, I mean, there was, for example, you may have read there was an anthrax outbreak a few years ago in Northern Russia, in Siberia. And uh, this was this was in, in a very warm summer, and it was probably thought to be transmitted out of out of reindeer carcass or something like this that had been frozen and then released this, and, and some people died, and and uh, so there were impacts of that sort. But that's the sort of thing. Anyway, okay. thanks, Tim. All right, Pam. Um, I 
thinking about the fact that in the definition of adaptation that Ian put up, uh, it also had the end phrase and exploit beneficial opportunities. And certainly the impacts community, when I started off in it, was very much about the sort of negative consequences. Mm. And something that we've become aware of when doing the UK climate change risk assessment, which we published recently, was actually when you look at biodiversity, the number of species that were projected to gain suitable climate space in the future was actually slightly more than those that were projected to lose suitable climate space. And so I do wonder whether looking at the opportunities and the opportunities you know, against you know, vulnerability, vulnerable species is a fruitful area. And perhaps we should be looking more to exploit mm. um, or at least to use those opportunities. OK, thanks, uh, Nigel. Right. Well, I've got two areas yeah. that I think um, my new students uh, ought to look at. Uh, one is seems quite a technical one, but it's quite a, a big one. Uh, and one is I think there's an increasing disconnect between the, the climate science community, and I'm speaking quietly because I'm in a meteorology building here, um, and the, the, the policy community. Um, climate models are increasingly complicated, increasingly expensive, and you can run them for only a small number of emission scenarios. And these are not the ones that are relevant to policy. Um, they're not the two and the four degree worlds, for example, that a lot of organisations are seeking to plan to. So we've got this disconnect between hmm. what the climate science community can produce and what, in a sense, the users are seeking. So there's an enormous scope for some translation phase in that. How do we bridge that link? Which, in my view, is an increasingly wide link between the, the complex climate models and what's useful for practice. There are techniques. That, that's one thing I think somebody should do. Uh, and the other one is we've become increasingly aware over the last year, two years, um, that it's not the direct risks or consequences of something that is the problem. It's the cascading changes that mm. follow on from the linked nature of all our systems. Um, and we can't quantify those. So we really need to look at these cascading and systemic risks triggered by climate events. Um, and other things, um, but we have to do that by blending in some really sophisticated and robust way the quantitative information that we can get on the direct risks with the more nuanced story type information on what is it that's driving exposure and vulnerability and so on. So I think there's a, there's a real need for, for, for bridging that gap as well. So there are several gaps that we need to fill. So that's what I would like to get my two students to do. <laughs> okay thanks well, obviously it's a bit bigger than that <laughs> yeah all right and and last but not least joe thanks very much well i personally believe that that we're lacking in understanding about the climate problematic as well as identifying solutions that are both effective and equitable because we still have a very narrow perspective and so i would say students should look for what i call deep interdisciplinary approaches and programs that actually make a bridge between the natural scientists and social scientists, which is, even though we've been talking about it for decades, is incredibly difficult and hasn't really been tried to an extent. By not having that perspective, we are not able to look at climate in context, which is really what I think is going to be the key. Not folks like us that maybe have been trained as climate scientists or environmental scientists, but having a broader approach to understand climate in its context of development and development goals in terms of equity, in terms of biodiversity. Otherwise, we're just going to keep missing the boat. We're just going to be coming up with partial solutions and then be wringing our hands as to figuring out why they're not being accepted broadly or are not working on the ground. Hmm. And I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative off for a few thoughts before I ask uh, Ian and Thea to weigh in on, on these questions and where the state of research is and where we're going. I would say three things. First is, I think, look, the climate system itself, what are we, you know, what, what's emerging in terms of properties, what surprises? People are looking at, for example, changes in circulation patterns, but, and, but some of these surprises, why, for example, is tropical cyclone behavior different? The, the, and in some ways, I'd say more dangerous than what we had projected. Uh, fire behavior we've certainly seen in uh, North America has been much more extreme than, than we thought, and, and maybe other things. And maybe other things are not turning out to be as bad, but it'd be interesting to, 
to look at observations and to see what did we not understand. Um, I also think, and I was picking up, I forgot which panels made this comment, but um, the importance of the social of, of, of people, and I think this is for, on policy side, both for mitigation and adaptation, we, we come up with these, oh, well, it's technically feasible to do this, you know, to reach this goal by this time. But that doesn't factor in what's what's politically feasible in terms of human behavior. I mean, let's face it, look at the reaction to gas prices, to a short term a, a, a spike in gas prices and what it means politically. Um, and it shows how difficult it is to impose pain as part of a, you know, part of a mitigation strategy. Uh, think on adaptation. We talk about all these things that need to be done. I was struck, Cynthia, in the Sunday's New York Times, interesting article about following Hurricane Sandy, there's rebuilding going on down in New York City all over. And there's rebuilding in Paradise, California, as I understand, in Mexico Beach, you know, places that have been devastated by hurricanes, fire, whatever. So what's, you know, what is about human behavior and how do we work within that? I think the same thing on mitigation. We talk about the feasibility technologies, but what turns out to be one of the barriers is connecting grids because people don't want things built in their backyard. And it's often in liberal areas that you get the greatest opposition to some of these solutions. So this is, you know, I think being taking a more holistic view and, you know, and understanding um, human behavior, which I think is something that Ian and, and Thea were, uh, were um, emphasizing. So with that, I'd like to turn it to uh, Ian and Thea just to see do, what thoughts do you have on these questions? Where, where, where have we come and where are we going? I don't know. I'm, I'm popping in, Joel, just to say, I wrote one of those articles on Sandy plus 10. Um, oh, I'll send, I'll oh, send it. I'll, yeah, I'll send it. Yeah, around. send it around, everybody. That would be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's um, yeah. You know, we. I mean, it is what it is, right? Understanding what are the what's feasible in terms of you and behavior, and and, and particularly in a democracy, you know, how much can you ask of people? Um, you know, it's very important. But but uh, um, Ian and Thea, what, what, would you like to weigh in on these on this discussion? Thea. Sure. Um, in regards to the first question, um, I don't have as much longevity, but uh, one of the things that I did realize that I wanted to point out was that with my naivety, I thought that, you know, hey, I'm talking about adaptation. Everybody should just be adapting and we should just put this into policy. And how come we wrote this and it got published by the government and it's not done, <laughs> right? So I had this really uh you know a view that things were instantaneous and i didn't realize um coming in that policy takes time policy change takes time um and uh that in itself made me change my view of adaptation how i research adaptation um probably my temperament <laughs> and you know the way i theorized it um so that's mostly my my uh, and just you know to tell everybody coming up uh, patients and that, you know, we have a, because of that, we have a gap to address, which by the way, the adaptation gap report, I think is being released tomorrow. So I'm oh. interested to, uh, to see that. Um, in relation to your second question, I had a more, um, I was going to say maladaptation, but I've already discussed that. So I'm just going to switch completely and say that my first publication was the compendium of adaptation models for climate change. Um, and when I did my thesis, I realized that tools were actually one of the big things that progressed countries to advance climate change adaptation. And we don't put a lot of time and energy into tools. So one um, creative idea would be to look at machine learning and adaptation and to figure out uh, what in relation to uh, uh, machine learning and tool advancement that we can have, because for some reason, there seems to be a greater uptake, whether it's with the public or whether it's with the uh, private sector or policy to uh, to use these and apply them and actually potentially make progress on adaptation. Hmm. That's good. All right. Thanks, Nan. Ian? Uh, thank you. At the risk of some repetition, but trying to address your questions, Joel, I think it is time for us to step back and rethink what we mean by adaptation. And that would mean re-looking at that old IPCC definition. Um, I think we need to go towards some better way of assessing the extent to which we're making progress on adaptation globally or not. Um, and then as far as students are concerned, <clears throat> 
I think there's this tremendous challenge. You know, if you if you're trapped in the educational system and you're trying to satisfy a mentor or a supervisor, you're very much encouraged to make a small bite of something that's manageable and I can write and I can complete in 500 pages. <laughs> but um, I think I would encourage students to think about their small bite in this broader overall context that we've been looking about and say, how do I prioritize what I choose to do for my small bite in the, in the, broader, in the broader context? And, and then I would also want to rethink a little bit in that context about the, the local versus global. There used to be, I think in the early days of the negotiations, maybe it still persists in some quarters, was the mantra that mitigation is global and adaptation is local. <laughs> and uh, I think we now realize that both are both and we need to think <laughs> about adaptation very much. Also in its global context of the root causes of problems. Uh, and we need to think about mitigation, of course, very much at a, a local as well as a global level. Thank you. All right, well, thanks. And thanks to the panelists. That was, that was a very thoughtful uh, remarks and uh, appreciate that. That was, that was a good discussion. So let me turn it back now to Manishka and Jennifer and uh, um, for the part two <laughs> of this effort. Thanks yeah. so much, Joe, and to the panelists. That was such a wonderful discussion. I feel I need to rewatch that part again because there's so much, uh, such good information there. So first up, we have Bob Chain, who has been a very regular participant of the webinar series. So I'm gonna, Bob, you should be able to speak now. Uh, great, and uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great, so good to see many of you, some of whom I've known for since you guys started in the climate change field. Um, and, and that sort of leads me to the question I put in the chat, which Joel started to partly address, but I think goes beyond. Uh, you know, maybe there are blind spots like wildfires and extreme storms that we just didn't have a good handle on uh, for the past few decades. Uh, but I also wonder if we're just bad at estimating the timing. Things seem to be upon us uh, a lot faster than people may have envisioned uh, 30 or 40 years ago. So, you know, another hypothesis is that we're just bad at the timing. Things are happening faster than we expected. Uh, another hypothesis is we have blind spots. There were things where the data wasn't good enough or the the science hadn't been applied to understand the sensitivity of ecosystems or, or how storm patterns might change. Um, and there may be other reasons why, uh, you know, one of them I think is a conservatism that, uh, you know, you don't wanna come out being too extreme in thinking about potential impacts. And so people like Jim Hansen were always treated as kind of the extreme uh, predictors of the bad impacts of impact of, of climate impacts, but in fact, he's probably in the middle uh, if we look retroactively, uh, but he was kind of treated as, as one extreme uh, in the, among the experts uh, thinking about it. So I'm just want to throw that question to, to you guys, you know, which, is, which factor or combination do you think was important and how is that affecting how we look ahead to, uh, you know, posing the challenge of adaptation and mitigation in the future. So just wondering, Manishka and Jen, should I just call on someone to, to, to see? Who Please I'm, do, Joe. Okay, yes. so and would anyone, let me just see, the panelists, just raise your hand. Anybody like to, yeah, Nigel, I see, go ahead and yeah, jump in on this. I don't think not everybody has to respond, but you're all, you'll have an, all have an opportunity. Yeah. I think that's a really good question, Bob. Um, and in my view, I think things have changed more rapidly than we expected. Um, so we're seeing more events, but also the, the, the discourse has changed and that people are looking at events in the context of a change rather than looking at events as just being well, part of history, part of what's happened. So the way I think policy, the public look at events now is in terms of climate change. So every time we see an event, it's now, is this due to climate change? 
The downside of that is that we begin to blame climate change for our past inaction, but that's a different matter. Um, but the UK has been quite an uh, interesting example this year. Um, we've I've for the last couple of years been going on about wildfire being an issue and um, various other bits in in various organizations have and it's always been a bit of a you know, it's, it, it happens in other places doesn't it <laughs> um, but this year we had more wildfires than ever which actually destroyed buildings rather than just burning a bit of very nice heathland and the attention has shifted really quite dramatically and I think it's the 10 years ago I probably wouldn't have only a few people had spotted that wildfire was an issue in the UK. Now it's right up the agenda. And I think there'll be more of these sort of things. So it's partly things are happening more rapidly. And it's partly because I think public and the policy communities are, are, are in the climate change mode. They're aware of climate and change in context. So everything is looked at through a climate change lens, partly to justify past inaction and partly to illustrate what's, what, what's going to get worse. Any other any other reactions to this? Yeah, Tim. Go ahead. Okay, um, I might be a bit controversial here, but um, we were doing projections back in uh, in the early '90s, and uh, we were using Jim Hansen's models, as it were. In, in fact, so so Jim Hansen's right. models, uh, the GIST models, were the first ones that actually gave transient change, so time dependent change, and so you could actually say something about the uh, time constants on on, on the change and and uh, that that group, uh, the GIST group, they gave um, upper, middle, and lower estimates. I think, if I remember rightly, depending on different emission trajectories at the time. And uh, if you look at the upper trajectory, and you convert that into, for example, shifts in um, suitability zones for crops, I think you'd find that um, they're fairly they're, they're fairly accurately um, sort of. Uh, borne out by the observed changes we've seen. So that's the sort of long-term change. So I might take issue a bit with, with Nigel on that for the average change, because I think actually some of us were actually projecting some of these changes way back. And uh, if you look at the model estimates as well, I mean, the climate model projections for a doubling of CO2 haven't changed very much. They're much the same as they always were. So uh, I don't think, I, th I think perhaps the perception of the change that the gr greater um, rate of changes is, is, is coming through the through the frequency distribution and the extremes and uh, may, maybe simply because we, we've been exceeding thresholds that we didn't even believe existed in our regions where we live or whatever uh, I think that's the point that uh, we haven't been sensitized to those uh, thresholds enough and uh, I, I can share the same sort of um, ideas about the forest uh, risk I think there's complacency in Finland about forest risk, for example, for forest fire. Mm -hmm. Sweden has had had quite a few uh, important uh, events, and uh, in Finland they they claim, oh, it's oh, we, we, we have more roads, and so we can manage the situation better. But I, I wonder if they could, if there, if there were forty degree temperatures. I, I simply just do not believe, and I, and I've talked with others who are fire experts, um, who who've come in from other countries who who are managing these fires. So, so I, I suspect there may be some thresholds that Finland hasn't seen yet for, for forest fire, for example. So, oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's we, did, we did see fires in the Arctic this summer, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Joe, you've got your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I kind of go along with Tim. Uh, I don't remember, I'm thinking about all the impact studies I was involved in with uh, the image model and in and, and IPCC and, um, my feeling is that actually we did have a set of projections out there that are being realized. What we didn't have was the resolution. So we couldn't say they're gonna be maybe particularly happening in this part of the country or another part of the country. It was, it was all, I, the way I've always put our evolution in climate impact science is that we've been getting stronger and stronger pairs of glasses as, as we go <laughs> along in the decades. Things that were there all the time, we're finally able to see. Yeah. You know, so that's that's one aspect. And the second aspect is that, well, you know, there just wasn't attention, I think, as Tom, uh, as Tim also referred to. I mean, we used to say this stuff, but it was just too outrageous. That's another message I've had over the years is I don't blame society for not acting on threats of climate change because it was just too outrageous, too pervasive. It's something that has been very difficult for society to absorb the fact that its entire climate, its entire environment is changing under its feet and above its feet. So, so um, 
I think those are the dynamics that are going on. I'm not too surprised what's happening. The only thing that maybe we did underestimate is that when we were talking about, I was involved in the UN by this, when we were talking about negotiations and targets, there was a sense around, which I have never been able to put my finger on, that somehow two degrees wouldn't be so bad. Although yeah, initially, yeah. now we realize, well, it's you know, whether it's one and a half or two degrees, the bad news is maybe one degree is bad, you know? Mm -hmm. So is, uh, yeah. maybe that's the one thing that we did get wrong, this idea of two degrees, although it was a necessity in terms of the negotiations mm -hmm. in the UN, I still would stand by it. If we didn't have a, a concrete target, we probably, we, now this is humanity, never would have converged on on Paris, on the, on the Paris Agreement, I would say. Well, I'll, I'll, let me jump in. Um, I would offer thought first, and I think uh, our long departed friend, Steve Schneider, who had brilliant insight into many things would say, you know, we were we were looking under the lamppost. We, we had to use the tools we had. So we had certain agriculture models, we had certain water models, we had certain climate scenarios, and we did, we kind of did the best we could. So one of the limitations was we, we tended to take long-term mean changes, maybe by month, and we would combine them with an observed data set. So Cynthia, when uh, you and I worked on the, the EPA report, we had 1951 to 80, and actually a fairly benign climate period, by the way. And then we added average changes and we looked at the, and then we looked at long-term averages, right? We really weren't, I mean, even though we had a transient scenario, we didn't really look at how things would change over time. We kind of looked at what was the equilibrium, but what's the new equilibrium? And we had adaptation and this was, you know, we did the best we could, but clearly there was a lot left out, you know, changes in variability, for example, um, we, we didn't know, right? So it was hard to factor those kind of things in, uh, obviously some of the changes in behavior. And, you know, we did the best we can. I remember when we did burning embers and we were trying to get a handle on how much change is dangerous. And I remember having this conversation, I'm sorry, I guess, guess Gary had to go, but I distinctly remember this conversation with Gary at the time saying, you know, we had one degree increments, one degree Celsius increments, because we felt we couldn't look at higher, you know, at, at point, you know, at less than a degree. We didn't have enough information. And so we say something about, you know, what, two degrees versus three. Now we see every tenth of a degree probably makes a difference. Uh, and um, uh, so, you know, you, you work, we worked with what we had. Um, you just have to keep improving. But I guess it's always with any of these things, I would always advise an ounce of humility, you know, not just what does your model show, what do you project, but what are you not capturing and what would make it worse, what might make it better. But I think that's that's important to add in. There's always such a rush to say, I have this result and here's the truth. And as opposed to, well, here's some insight, but here's also what we don't understand. So all right, Manishka, and yes. any other questions? Yes. Or see Thanks, what time, so, time yes, that's we, left? Yes. So we have about seven or eight minutes, and I think we'll tackle two. So uh, Jen will read out the question from Kirsten first, and then Imani had raised a hand but wanted her question read out. So we'll do those two briefly. Okay. Over to you, Jen. Okay. Uh, so from Kirsten Path, one of the common phrases heard from leaders and climate change researchers is the youth gives me faith for the future. Considering the urgent need for action right now, is it realistic to expect a generation that is 10 to 20 years away from having any sort of influence to save the world? Isn't this attitude just a way to shove the responsibility to fix previous generations' failures onto future generations? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> Ian, would you know the thoughts? No. <laughs> Does anybody want that? That's a damn good question. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I always say to the younger generation, look at the gifts we're giving you. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, 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 you know, we're doing the best we can, but it's true. I think, I think frankly, and I, and I have to say it, it just strikes me more and more. And I see it in, in us politics and elsewhere. People have high internal discount rates. Okay. The economists will get that right. People focus on short term and we have been working for a long time to get people to look beyond today, look 10, 20, 30 years in the future. And it's hard. And I frankly feel we're no better at, at it today 2022 than we were in i don't know when i you know when we first published the uh, epa report say in 1989 i mean it's just hard to get people to look at the longer term and therefore that does end up 
tossing long-term problems onto future generations, especially when they're, emer we knew this was gonna be a problem, right? We may be surprised exactly how it's playing out. Um, by the way, I'm offered a quick observation that I think, you know, the good news is the emissions have come down. We're now projecting something like two to three degrees of warming. That's good. The bad news is I think the system's more sensitive than we thought. So where we are in net, we have to see. But Nigel, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, the, the point I'd like to make is that I think we've we've spent a long time as the community and so on talking about how bad things are going to get it if we don't do anything. To me, the blockages now are not people not realizing that it's going to get bad in the long term. The blockages are people believing that the solutions that we need to adopt to address these things now are too expensive, too costly, too disruptive, hmm. would increase the price of gas too much. So what we really need to do is have a go at the critiques of doing something about climate change. You know, the communities that believe they will be badly affected by measures to reduce fossil fuels and so on. That's where we're going to get more traction. It's not by going on about how bad floods are going to be in the future. It's going to be about how the energy transition is not going to be as bad as the those who are most against it say. So it's changing the nature of the argument, I think, is important. Any other thoughts on this before we go to the next question? OK, next question. Sure, I can read it out. OK. Uh, I realize that the focus here is on adaptation, but the rate of producing these effects will greatly outstrip adaptation. Has there been an attempt to prioritize mitigation efforts, much like Project Drawdown has done, in order to be more proactive than reactive to the disasters on each continent? What is the strategy to address industrial outputs that contribute to climate change since we have more than enough observational data as proof? Don't forget the economists, since this is what perpetuates climate change. Do you have any easy questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone want to tackle this one? <laughs> okay, thanks, Nigel. Go ahead. Well, I refer to the answer to the previous question, <laughs> Your Honor. Um, it's about addressing the barriers to action rather than arguing that if we don't do anything, this, this, this will happen. It's about addressing where the blockages are. And yeah. it's about yeah, I, making the transition work um, and recognizing that there will be tough choices in that transition, um, but it's addressing the transition head on, I think, rather than saying, if we don't do anything, it'll go, be awful. It'll be, we have to manage this transition. It can be done. And that's where the effort and that's where the, the political and the economic effort should be. Any other thoughts? Joe? The reality is that this crazy period that we're in right, is sensitizing, sensitizing people to the fact that things have to change. So I'm afraid um, I've noticed at the university and traveling around at various conferences or online at conferences, I perceive anyway a greater openness to ideas on how we can change. So I think we have to grab this opportunity, this idea of transformational change, these ideas of, of a rapid transition, et cetera, et cetera. I believe the discussion at least, if not the transition itself, is increasing in velocity or is accelerating, let's say. So I think we just need to, I'm not saying dig up all of our old ideas about the regenerative economy, about the circular economy, about uh, renewable energy, about uh, sustainable agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. But it is a good time for good ideas. Uh, we just have to be a bit bold about it. Not, uh, we have to keep a positive face to it because I think we're humans. The, the, the people that are working in climate science, climate policy, sustainability, whatever, are people. And we're all feeling a little bit down because of this, but we have to get past it. This is an opportunity to convince people of the good set of ideas that are out there. If the practical, not only from the technical standpoint, but also from the equity standpoint. Yeah, and, and I'll jump in and say, I think, and, and that's a good positive note. I think change does come. In fact, I wanna pick up on a, a comment you made during your remarks, Thea, that it, it takes time. You don't see these, sometimes there's this expectation we're gonna do things overnight or you know next year. No, I think 
think on decadal time steps and but things do have look what's happened in terms of energy use you know renewables coming on coal decreasing um you know so that's i mean that's positive just the fact that the emissions have come down quite a lot so that now the baseline is a lot lower than we had thought just five ten years ago and i also think on the adaptation side you are seeing a lot going on it's not easy and there are setbacks but you do see things so you have to and a lot of it is just keeping pressure on and looking for opportunity and then being clever what what's feasible you know what does uh what do what can homo sapiens do and not do in understanding what's and then pushing where you can pam um just a very sort of quick comment i think um while i recognize the you know need for mitigation i really think we should be looking at mitigation and adaptation together and make sure that we're trying to focus on the sort of synergies so i would not want to see a polarized sort of response I think we need to see where mitigation can assist in adaptation and vice versa all right that's good all right thanks so I don't know maybe with a few minutes left turn it back to uh our organizers thanks panelists appreciate that was that was very good thank you well what do you Cynthia Wonderful. Well, thank you. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Wrap up. Um, thank you, Tim. Please put your last comment in the chat. We really want to know what it is. Um, now it's my my opportunity to do the final wrap up of really the entire book project as well as the webinar series. <clears throat> so there's a lot of thank yous. First of all, thank you to the authors who first of all did their wonderful uh, chapters and their slides and their references and their notes um, that that go make up the book um, itself. And then thank you to all of the authors who then stepped up and agreed to give their lectures in person so that we could then um, uh, make sure that they that that uh, we have preserved them as a resource. Next at the World Scientific Publishing Company, uh, Svi Ruder is our really, really wonderful development senior development editor there, um, and uh, who has supported the project all the way through. And I also want to do a shout out to Amanda Yun. Uh, she's based in Singapore, and uh, for the really the she's the production editor. The beautiful book that that it, that it truly is. Uh, next, I want to thank David Rind, um, who is the series editor uh, for the whole series on lectures in climate change, but also who really supported, really stepped up to support the webinar series this uh, this entire year. Now, everybody on this call, we need to now, I'm not only the designated clapper, but the real designated heartfelt thanks to Manishka and Jen Evans, who made this webinar happen. Thank you so much, Manishka and Jen. Uh, just you can see from the comments in the chats, uh, we've been receiving emails of appreciation. Thank you, Manishka and Jen for making this happen. Uh, and it's such a wonderful product that will continue. Um, uh, next, I wanna thank Dan Bader from the NOAA um, uh, RESA program, our local uh, NOAA RESA program, uh, Center for Climate Research, uh, um, I'm forgetting the acronym, CC RUN, um, on the, in the urban Northeast. Um, uh, for hosting the, um, for hosting the, um, uh, lectures on the, both the CC Run website and their YouTube channel. We're going to be working on that, um, as Manishka said, um, and as Martin is encouraging us to do, we'll be continuing to work on that and we'll be calling on all of you to help, uh, uh spread those downloads. Um, and next is uh, Matt Pierce. I'm not sure he's with us today. He was with us on many, many of the uh, webinars. He is the head of our fantastic, and speaking of the next generation coming up, Matt is the head of 
our fantastic education program at our institute, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He uh, works tirelessly setting up programs that are constantly running on with high school students, with high school teachers, with undergraduate students, undergraduate professors, and graduate students, and then all of us as mentors. So um, Matt and Matt has really supported our warming planet um, through his NASA education program. And finally, finally, I want to thank the audience and the participants. Um, really, as uh, uh, we saw from, from the statistics, uh, over a thousand people participated in this webinar series. There's been over 1500 downloads of the talk so far. So we are really, re so we're, we, we are, have already reached so many people across some, so many different aspects of climate change and working on it. Um, and I do believe it's both a combination of not just the, the, of some of the older folks who wrote some of the chapters, but by the way, there are chapters by early career researchers as well in the book, but lots of early career um, research researchers as well. So listen, how are, you know, it's been so wonderful. As Joel said, it really truly is a, has been a community this year. And let's keep in touch and see what we can do to continue. But thank you so much. All the best to you, to everyone in their work on climate change solutions, um, patience, patience, but solutions, uh, extreme events, um, deepening understanding and the, tr the true need for adaptation that Ian and Thea so much um, brought forward today. Thanks also to Joel and all the panelists today. Thank you. T please keep in touch. Bye.